Thank you. Thank you so much for thinking of it that way. And I'm good. So that kind of helped a little bit. Cool. Yeah, so there's a fun. So there's a couple of roses from over there. So kind of fun, the different things she does. Yeah. So we found her on. Uh, the street market at Manly Bay. And I got one to bring. Yeah. And I had two shipped to them. So, so yeah, they're shaking. Yeah, I made sure to put it Yeah. I can see them on mine. Oh, I can see them. Yeah. Hey, yeah, that's what. Yeah. Last 30 seconds. It takes four minutes I to go by. <laughs> right? Sit there and stare at it. Last 30 seconds. Well, I say that three. You keep Yeah, remind me to put you the book up. Okay, we'd like to welcome everyone today and call to order the study meeting for the West Valley City Council. It is December 13th, 2022, 4.30 p.m., and we're in the multi-purpose room of West Valley City Hall. We have all members of the council present. We have Councilman Norfeld, Councilman Christensen, and Councilman Hoon, and myself in person. We have Councilman Fitzy Devanu, Councilman Whetstone, and Councilman Harmon all on Zoom. You're also joined online by Mr. Pyle, our city manager, and then we have Ms. Kamek, our city recorder here at the desk with us. Um, with those introductions, we now have the minutes of December 6, 2022. I'll turn it to the council for discussion or a motion on those minutes. Motion to approve. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 And there we go, they are asked. Thank you. We have our review of tonight's meeting. Were there any changes, Mr. Pyle, or anything we needed to go over? No changes, ma'am, thanks. We cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? No, uh, nope. Wayne, I can hear you. Okay, Eric, give him permission to talk. Okay. He's got <laughs> permission, but I'm not sure. I can hear you too. I can hear him. On, on his end. I don't think any of the others can speak. <laughs> can, we can hear them either. Jake, can you try to talk? I can hear Will and Scott. And yeah, can you hear me? Oh, okay. Can you hear me? Eric might figure it out. So no one can talk, so just give us a minute for the online people. Speakers. Yeah, I think it's going to work now. Yeah, thanks. Right now. All right, Mr. Paul okay. John. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. All right, perfect. Thank you. Uh, yeah, changes to the uh, 
uh, regular meeting agenda, ma'am. Okay. Does anybody have any questions or concerns? Okay. Seeing none, we will move on to our public hearing for next week or January 3rd. Um, the reopening of the budget, and we have Mr. Welch here in person. Thank you, Mayor. Appreciate that. Um, as you had mentioned, this is our quarterly budget opening where we uh, reevaluate the budget and we uh, make some adjustments to recognize additional revenues, uh, rollovers from previous projects, and uh, other expenditures that have come up that were not in the original budget. Uh, this being the second one doesn't have as many as the original, as the first budget opening did. There's a couple of things I'd like to note. It's divided up into three areas. There's rollovers, which are typically um, grants that we received in previous periods that all the funds haven't been spent for. As you look through the um, grants and the rollover section, they have dates on those and they're designated by the year received. And that's, that's universal in how we track the grants. So this is how much money we have left on those particular grants. The next section is new grants that we've received uh, for certain types of operations within the city. Uh, of note, uh, one of those that stands out a little bit differently is the uh, police department's liquor tax grant. This We track this as a grant, grant but this is actually a uh, tax that's imposed on the sale of liquor uh, within the city, but it's designated specifically for um, uh, drunk driving enforcement and activities for the police department. So that's that's a specific purpose that the police that the uh, legislature put in place for that. Uh, under other things, we have uh, I'll point out the purchase of police vehicles from our auctions. When we have used vehicles that have uh, exceeded their useful life, we'll take them out and we'll auction them in a commercially reasonable manner. And we usually take that money and it comes back and buys new vehicles, which we've actually had some pretty good sales lately. The uh, used car market's been very good. And so it's allowed us to bring a few more vehicles back onto the fleet, uh, which we were very appreciative of. Some other things that we've had is uh, because we are a participant in the Valley Emergency Communication Center, there's an annual assessment there. And then there's also a, um, an increase for the call center that uh, we usually don't find those out until after the budget has been completed. So they're not able to be included in the original budget. We have a donation uh, to the Harmon home from the Harmon family, which we receive every year. They've actually increased that a little bit. This is $20,000 above what our original contract was, and we're very grateful for that. It goes for the operations there. Uh, you, most of the other ones you'll recognize, my hometown projects. Uh, that's We've talked about that quite a bit here. Uh, also, the SCBA units, which is probably the biggest one on there, that the uh, fire department brought to city council several weeks ago, um, where they needed new breathing apparatus and the equipment and compressors that go along with that in order to maintain uh, their equipment in a safe and operable manner. So with that, that's the quarterly budget opening, and uh, we'll uh, be happy to entertain any questions you might have about that. And we'll probably see you in another couple of months with any more changes since this one. Okay, I'll turn it to the council. Was there any questions or concerns with this line item? I'll be there. Just one thing, Kim. Sure. Concern. Just thank you for doing it for me. I uh, approved the 2023 budget or helped approve it for the Mosquito Abatement District last night. First, we had to approve. 2022 budget because it was amended they had been amending it all year and so it seemed kind of interesting to approve one budget for this year that's ending and then the budget for next year thank you doing it the way you do it appreciate it yeah there's a there's not a prescriptive way of doing the budget openings but we felt like quarterly brought it to the council uh, frequently enough that it was meaningful and uh, also, it wasn't so infrequent that uh, we had a huge pile when it came in. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. See nothing else. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We now have resolution 22 164. Mr. Pyle, did you have anything to add before we turn it over to Mr. Wilson? No, ma'am. I'm good on this one. Thank you. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, this item uh, should not be a surprise to you. We talked about this in our CIP update a couple of weeks ago. This is for additional funding for our Lancer Way reconstruction project. Um, we already have the federal aid agreement executed for the federal funds. This is for the state money. Um, this, this agreement with UDOT is to enable us to access the state funds to move forward with design and construction of the project. Just a quick update on the project. We did receive proposals this week for the design consultants. So we will be selecting those, uh, the designer within the next week or two and getting started on the design of this project. So. Hey. Thank you. Anything from the council? All right. It looks like you have the next one too. <clears throat> Resolution 22-165. I'll let you go into it and then Mr. Pyle can add at the end if he had something. Okay. Yep. This is for a modification to the federal aid agreement for our Parkway Boulevard project. Um, as you know, we discussed that we requested additional STP money, uh, federal money. Um, from Wasatch Front uh, in October, and we were awarded $1.9 million of additional STP money. So this is just to modify that federal aid agreement to access those funds. Okay. And hasn't WFRC had to increase a lot of these contracts because the price has gone up so much? Uh, it, it's very common now that all projects are underfunded. Um, obviously, WFRC has a certain amount of funds they're dealing with, so um, there are requests that aren't always granted, but yes, it's it's becoming a common common problem. So. Okay, sounds great. Mr. Pyle, did you have anything to add? I didn't, thanks, ma'am. Okay, anything from the council on this one? Okay, thanks. thank you. All right, well, now to go to our communications items, and we'll start with Bangor Highway update. And Alex? Yes, thank okay. you. Um, Willis is our person representing you from Utah. Utah. Yep. yep, thank you. I appreciate the time this evening to kind of give you guys an update on the Bangor Highway state environmental status. Um, my name is Alex Fisher Willis. I am the UDOT project manager for the 4100 South to California segment. I have with me Brian Atkinson. He's our consultant project manager. He's been on Bangor Highway project since 2015, and he's got a lot of background on the freeway construction of Bangor Highway. We also have Katie Corianos. She is our public involvement lead. She's been very involved in interfacing with the public, setting up our um, scoping meetings, and starting in February, we'll be having our big public scoping meetings, quite a few of them for our preferred alternatives. So she's been really busy, definitely both great assets. And if you guys have questions, I might be pinging to them because they've got some information as well. Um, so last time we met with you guys, it was back in August. We gave you an update on some of the comments we received during the scoping period. We also announced the smart growth workshop that we held in August, uh, was August 31st. Thank you, Mayor, again for coming. Um, I think we got some really good feedback during that workshop. Since then, our team's been working on the engineering and environmental analysis of um, this segment of the corridor. And we've developed four different alternatives, which I'll walk through. And we've kind of, we've had two screenings that we've done. We've completed one screening. We have all the data prepared for the level two screening. And I'll present all that to you and I'll wrap everything up with an update on the 4700 South Interchange Project. So before I jump into where we're at with this study, just wanna give everybody a reminder of where Bangor Highway has been. Um, starting in 2012, we, been, we began <clears throat> constructing the interchanges. Um, we began at 7800 South. We also started building the CFI intersections similar to 3500 South and 4100 South to help with the travel demands at the time. In 2016, we had UDOT did a traffic study, sorry, a study on what intersections needed to be converted to freeway next. At that point, we had about 15 remaining intersections. That study determined that the segment 41st to California would kind of be the last phase of Bangor to be converted to freeway. Uh, to date, we have 10 of the intersections have been converted to freeway. We have four that are slated for construction beginning late next year and wrapping up by 2025. 4700 South is one of those. And um, just wanted to note that this section 41st to California is not funded for construction until 2028. So we have a little bit of time before we'll see any construction happen, but we wanted to get on top of the environmental study to make sure we had plenty of time to evaluate the impacts. 
So number one reason why we've been converting Bangor Highway to a freeway system, currently we're seeing 60,000 vehicles per day along the corridor. By 2050, that's going to more than double. We'll have over 120,000 vehicles. So that's a lot of cars, a lot of traffic that we're going to have to deal with. <clears throat> and if we don't do anything, we will see delays four times greater than what we're currently seeing at those stoplights. So it's a pretty impactful um, segment of the corridor with all that additional traffic. Also, now that the southern half of Bangor Highway has been converted to a freeway system, there's going to be a driver expectation. And once you drive from a freeway and enter an expressway, your uh, safety issues become exp exponentially higher. So, so there's a really big safety component to converting it to a freeway system as well. As we've gone through this study, we wanted to make sure we considered the UDOT quality of life framework. This framework was developed in collaboration with UDOT's partnering agencies, WFRC, some of the cities, counties, and UTA. And there's four main criteria that were um, developed out of this. Good health, better mobility, strong economy, and connected communities. And as we developed our criteria through our screening process, we wanted to make sure we really focused on these aspects so that we're building the best segment of Bangor Corridor we can come up with. For the state environmental study process, um, we began with the concept review just about a year ago, started looking at what options we have. Um, then we had our public scoping period. And during that time, we had our scoping meetings. Uh, we held them at Granger High School, got some really good feedback from residents and businesses in the area. And with that, we came up with four different alternatives. And I'll walk you through those four alternatives um, here in a minute. Currently, we're in the alternative screening process. So we're walking through all four of those, looking at different um, criteria and screening out anything that doesn't meet what we feel is required to construct the freeway system. With that, we'll have our preferred alternative selected and have our public hearings. As I mentioned, we're aiming to start those in February of next year with the overall goal of developing a final state environmental study. So I mentioned the UDOT Bangor concept study that was in, developed in 2016. That determined which intersections needed to be prioritized. That study took about six months to complete and it focused mostly on traffic data. In 2020, West Valley City also did a study um, focusing on frontage roads between 3500 South and SR201. Just wanna note that study only took about two months and it also just focused on traffic data. This state environmental study differs from those two. It's gonna take about two years for us to, from start to finish to um, come up with our final alternative. And we're looking a lot more items than just traffic. We're looking at right-of-way impacts, cost, environmental impacts, and it's, it's just a lot broader scope. Also, it is required to do this level of environmental study for us to construct. So that's why we've had multiple studies along this section of the corridor. I also want to note that Avenue Consultants helped West Valley develop their traffic models for their study, and we have also hired them to do all of our traffic modeling. So we've had some consistency um, through all of these studies to make sure we're not recreating the wheel. Um, through those two studies, we came up with kind of two main alternatives. We looked at West Valley's frontage road option. And because our limits extended beyond that 35th to 201, we realized we actually needed to evaluate frontage roads from 41st all the way to California to have a true justifiable document. That way we can define those limits of the frontage road more accurately. So we started with two alternatives, full frontage road and full interchanges. And with coordination with Dan and his team, we came up with what we're calling the hybrid option, which really matches what was in the West Valley study. Um, frontage roads from 35th South to just north of SR201. And then we also looked at what we're calling the 3100 South alternative. So just kind of give you better definition of what these four alternatives are. Um, I have a map on the next screen. You guys feel free to zoom into that. I'll also walk you through it. The full frontage road, again, full frontage system from 41st to California. The interchange option is different than what we've done on other segments of uh, Bangor Highway. The intersections between 3500 South and SR201 are about half a mile apart. That is too close for us to put a full interchange at each of those intersections that are currently there. So we would actually lose access on and off of Bangor Highway at 3100 South and 2400 South with this option, but we'd have full interchanges through the rest of the corridor. The hybrid option, um, again, is similar to the West Valley study that was done in 2020. It would be a full interchange at 41st South and California Avenue, and then it would be a frontage road system starting at 35th 
1820 South, which is just north of SR 201. Um, and this 3100 South access option includes on and off, actually, sorry, it just includes on ramps onto Bangor Highway at 3100 South. So step back a little bit. Hopefully you guys can still hear me. Um, here's the frontage road option. And with these graphics, we zoom them in just to 35th to 201. All four of these alternatives at 41st and California are very similar layout. So we wanted to really highlight what was different between these four too. That's why they're kind of zoomed in. So the alternative A has the frontage road system. You can see it's quite a bit wider footprint than some of the other alternatives. Alternative B is the interchange. So you can see a full interchange at 35th, full interchange at Parkway, and then at 31st and 2400 South, um, we are eliminating access on and off of Bangor Highway, but we will maintain connectivity east and west. So you'll still be able to cross over Bangor Highway or cross under Bangor Highway to get to the other side of the city. The hybrid option, again, it's the frontage road system from 35th to 201. So in this zoomed in view, it looks very similar to alternative A, just like I said, A goes all the way to 41st California. And then D is the um, interchange and access at 3100 South. So we have the same interchanges at 3500 South and Parkway Boulevard. But you'll notice at 30, 3100 South, there are these on-ramps going northbound and on-ramps going southbound. Um, unfortunately, we don't have room to do off-ramps at that location as well. They would encroach into the on-ramps at 35th and Parkway. So if you got on the on-ramp at 3500 South going northbound, you would end up on 3100 South before you could merge over if we had off-ramps there. So that's why that layout was selected that way. So with those four alternatives selected, we began our screening criteria. Um, as I mentioned, we had two steps in our screening levels. <clears throat> so level screening one, level one screening, um, focused on traffic data and accessibility on and off of Bangor Highway. The first category or first criteria we looked at was providing a level service D or better at key intersections. Those key intersections are the intersections at Bangor Highway. And just to give you an idea what level service of D is, that's if you pull up to a stoplight, turns red, turns green, you move forward a little bit, turns red again. Level service E is you sit through one more cycle and F is another cycle. So we consider that failing um, level of service traffic. So we want at least C or better so you can actually get through that stoplight and continue on your travels. Um, the only alternative that did not pass this, this criteria is the full frontage road. And that is because all of the traffic at 4100 South gets on the frontage road, makes their way to 3500 South. They don't actually access Bangor Highway until north of 3500 South. And it essentially just shuts down the whole corridor on 3500 South. So that, that was failing. The rest of them had great um, performance along the corridor. The second item we looked at was accessibility within half a mile of current travel routes on and off of Bangor Highway. We wanted to make sure that if we're eliminating access at 35th and 24th, that we weren't extending people's travel distance um, substantially to get onto the inner, to get onto Bangor. And what we found is all of the alternatives, the way we've laid them out, it is less than half a mile. So all four categories passed. The third criteria is maintaining an acceptable, acceptable level of service at eight adjacent intersections. Um, working with the city staff, there was some concern <clears throat> about the additional traffic that they would see on 40th West, 36th West, and 32nd West, if we eliminate that access on 31st and 24th. What was interesting was the only one that failed the level of service at those intersections was the full frontage road option. And again, it's because all that traffic at 41st is on the frontage road at 35th and just kind of gums up that whole system. So that one did not pass. The rest of them did though. So that, that was um, exciting for us to see. The fourth criteria that we looked at, which it's kind of funny that it's fourth because it's the goal of our project, but eliminating at grade intersections on Bangor Highway. Um, all of these make that happen, turns it into a freeway system. So that's good that we met that goal with all of our alternatives. And then the fifth one is improving walking and biking facilities in the study area. When we started looking at the potential footprints of this project, um, it was, brought up, why don't we look at like a shared use path? Um, either on one side, both sides, let's let's start having these conversations. And 
what we what we found is there was actually a lot of support, not just from West Valley City, Salt Lake City, Salt Lake County, WFRC, everybody was pretty on board with us um, incorporating a shared use path. We also, as I mentioned, had the Smart Growth Workshop, met with members of the community to look at um, mid-block crossings, especially near Granger High School, but also north of 35th as well, to make sure we're connecting the communities for both sides of the freeway system when it's built. So all four of our alternatives have a shared use path and some of those mid-block crossings. With that, all three, three options, B, C, and D, have been moved forward to level two screening. Um, the alternative A has not been moved forward. But before I jump into level two screening, I wanna talk about some of the other things we looked at regarding traffic, um, especially in coordination with the city staff. There has been a lot of conversation about the additional travel time to get to certain locations if we eliminate access. And we modeled traffic routes, travel routes to different areas in the Valley, just to see how long it would take to get from anywhere within West Valley to say the airport or Jordan Landing. And what we found is in all three criteria, it or all three alternatives, it only took, it, it was less than a minute time difference to get to those locations. So we decided to look at locations actually within the city itself. Um, so just to walk you through a couple routes that we looked at. So say you're American Prep Academy on 3100 South and you wanna to go to the airport. Now I do wanna note in this particular alternative, if, you, if we did the 3100 South access, be similar to the hybrid route. I lost the mouse. There we go. So if you are on the hybrid option, you would just go westbound on 3100 South, hop on the frontage road or the on-ramp if it's the 3100 South access option and get right onto Bangor and make your way north. If you are on the interchange option, you can't get on to Bangor at 31st. So you would go northbound on 36 West. Oops. Sorry, move the mouse the wrong way. There we go. Get on to 36 West, head north, make your way onto Parkway, and get on to Bangor from there, and get to the airport. And it's a 0.1 minute time difference between those two options. So we wanted to look at the southern route too. Let's say you're at American Prep Academy and you need to go to Home Depot, somehow I managed to replay it instead of pausing it. Sorry about that. All right, so you're going to Home Depot. I think most everybody in this room has probably been to Home Depot. So same thing, um, instead of going onto the frontage road system, if you're leaving American Prep Academy on the interchange option, you would take 36 West, head south, make your way to 35th, get on a bank order from there, head down to 47th and now you can buy all your paint and home supplies. And that one really was the largest difference we saw and it was still less than half of a minute to travel that additional route. So we decided we need to look at East and West as well. Um, we just were headed to the West Valley Fitness Center from City Hall. Um, so from here, you would get onto Lancer Way, turn onto 32nd West, if you're on the hybrid option, you would get onto 35th and make your way onto the frontage road. If you're on the interchange option or the 3100 South access option, you would want to stay on 32nd West because if you get on Bangor, you can't get off Bangor at 31st. And then you'd go down 31st and make your way to the fitness center, maybe for some pool time or hit the ice skating rink. And again, it's a 0.1 minute difference. So pretty insignificant. So I said, I probably need to look at going the other direction. So Family Fitness Center, we're headed to Valley Junior High. Dang it, I hit it again. Sorry about that, guys. Let's see if I can fast forward. There we go. So we'll head to Valley Junior High. Um, this option shows some of the different ramp configurations on the frontage road the best, because it takes a minute for you to actually get onto the frontage road from here or it takes a minute for you to get onto Bangor Highway, you're gonna commute on the frontage road for quite a minute. Um, so it actually takes less time to get to Valley Junior High from the fitness center than it would on the interchange option. So before I move into level two screening, do you guys have any questions on the level one screening or the traffic analysis we've done? You'll have to look online. No, okay. Okay, perfect. We'll move to <clears throat> level two screening. 
So in our level two screening, we focused on right away impacts and the current estimated cost of the different alternatives. Um, again, we did not bring alternative A through to level two because it did not pass the traffic. So we're just looking at B, C, and D. Um, with this table, we have relocations, potential relocations, and partial acquisitions. One thing we wanted to make sure we broke out for the council to really see is the, the impacts to West Valley themselves, because this project does span into Salt Lake City. And the impacts are pretty, pretty high. It's pretty substantial. Um, residential relocations for interchanges is 178. It's almost 100 more for the frontage hybrid option. And the 3100 South option is um, 258 total relocations for residents. And all of those residential relocations are within West Valley city limits. For commercial relocations, we're seeing 14 in alternative B, 16 in alternative C, and 14 in alternative D. 11 for West Valley commercial relocations, that's 11, 12, and 11. So still losing quite a few businesses in the, the, along the corridor. Um, that leads for a total parcels impacted for alternative B, 300, for alternative C, 404, and alternative D, 386. So all of these alternatives are pretty impactful to the community. And most of our cost difference is affiliated with the right-of-way acquisitions that would be required. Um, when we... While we've been studying this corridor, our team broke it down into four different segments. 41st to 38th is segment one, 38th to Great Lake is segment two, Great Lakes to Ninigrit, which is just north of 1820, so into the Salt Lake City side. Um, that's our segment three, and then Ninigrit to California is our segment four. And we just did that for ease of us to kind of chopping stuff up into the different um, layouts and configurations of the roadway. Um, the largest cost difference between all three alternatives is within that segment two and segment three options, and that is from the right-of-way impacts. Those are directly tied. So currently we're seeing total estimates for the whole project. Um, alternative B, about 1.6 billion. Alternative C, just over 1.9 billion. And alternative D is 1.68 billion. Um, so it's it's pretty costly. It's uh, going to be a very expensive project. These costs are, these estimates are fairly conservative using what we've been seeing with the inflation rates and whatnot. Um, these costs are also in 2028. So we're hoping to budget for whatever is to come in five years, but it's, it's pretty, pretty substantial cost. So just to kind of recap on what we've looked at, again, we've screened out alternative A, um, alternative B, we're seeing, you know, 300 right away impacts and $1.6 billion budget or potential cost estimate. <clears throat> the hybrid, which is the frontage roads from 35th to 201 or to 1820, um, 404 in parcels impacted and a budget of $1.9 billion. And then the 3100 South Access with uh, almost 400 impacts and a estimate of $1.68 billion. So any questions on the level two screening at this point? Awesome. <laughs> so our next steps, um, we will continue refining our horizontal design. I do want to note, um, you may have heard talks about refining vertical design on past Vingator projects, specifically 4700 South. Along this section of the corridor, the water table is very high. And in conversations with West Valley staff and UDOT leadership, um, none of us want to install or maintain pumps to have tunnels and Bangor going underneath. So most of the corridor is going to be Bangor going over. However, at 4100 South, there is potential for us to potentially take Bangor under. The water table is still fairly high, so we have to work out some of that design detail. So that's the only location we would be refining the vertical alignment. Um, we are looking at the east-west shift to help minimize impacts. The right-of-way impacts I've shown are our worst case scenario. So we're, we're still refining. Hopefully we can cut some of those impacts down. Um, we're also looking at environmental resources, historic homes, noise. Um, I mentioned the walking and biking facilities. That's something that we really um, want to emphasize and make sure we're not just building a shared use path along Bangor Highway. We wanna make sure we're connecting it to 
existing and future facilities. Um, I know Kobe has been working on a lot of projects on 3100 South and Parkway Boulevard. We want to make sure whatever we built <clears throat> connects to those. We're also working with Salt Lake City and Taylorsville to connect into their future and existing facilities. Our goal is to have our draft document submitted to UDOT um, next month. So we've got a lot of work to do over the next few weeks. And once that's released, we'll begin having our um, public engagement events. We have a lot of events coming up. We will do them both virtually and in person. Um, Katie's been working to set up some pop-ups throughout the community to help us connect with some of the um, residents that we've had struggles getting in touch with, especially minority community. Um, we also will have neighborhood meetings. These neighborhood meetings are invitation only to the residents that actually are going to be impacted. And it gives them an opportunity to talk to the project team as well as the right-of-way team and get an understanding of what that right-of-way process is. And then we will have our public hearing meetings, which are open to the public, and we'll do those again in person and online. And our goal is to have our final document signed with the preferred alternative and complete by June of next year at the latest. Um, again, I want to note that we don't have funding until 2028, and the funding that we do have is about a third of what our estimates are showing. So we're not going to be able to move forward until any of that gets pushed up. So any right of way impacts would <clears throat> any right of way acquisitions most likely will not happen until 2028 and construction as well. Um, I do want to know if if we do continue down this path, we do have some relocations with the Jordan Valley Aqueduct. And we plan to follow the same process that the 4700 South project has done. We've already been coordinating with the Bureau and Jordan Valley Conservancy District. So there is potential that that work could begin 2027 to get that aqueduct relocated. Any questions on the 41st California segment? Okay. I'll just give you a brief update on 4700 South. Um, we have selected our contractor designer. <laughs> They have started design work. They're going to be designing through this summer. Um, as I mentioned, the Jordan Valley Aqueduct process has gone pretty smoothly. We've worked with the Bureau and Jordan Valley Conservancy District and their designer to make sure their designs coordinate with what we're going to be doing. And they should start actually relocating the aqueduct this summer and finish by early 2024. And then our construction on the interchange will begin 2024 and be complete by 2025. Um, with that, all of the full relocations have been signed, I believe, and all the houses along Orleans Way have been purchased and dem demolished um, in prepare to prepare for the Jordan Valley relocation. So that's what we got. That's a lot of information. So <laughs> it is. Are you ready for phone calls after? I sure I'll be getting. <laughs> okay. Any questions from the council? So all of the timelines and the project funding or budget that's been proposed, those are all for the above. I don't know the terminology, but we've been talking about whether the road goes under or over. Mm -hmm. This is just the, the standard. This is UD, our UDOS proposal. Um, is there anything that's out there as alternatives? Should there be any interest in any of the cities wanting to do the alternate route? On 47th or the 41st California? Any of them. Um, so 47th, I, Brian probably has more information on which way that's going to go. I don't know if you want to come up and address that one. Yeah, so like Alex mentioned on 47th, we've selected a designer and a contract team to help us get all the final costs worked out and get that uh, developed and organized. Um, UDOT has uh, directed us to proceed moving as if Bangor is going under there. And as long as we don't see anything that surprises us or changes those budgets, the plan is to take Bangor under at 47th. Um, but we've got some work to do just to verify that and make sure everything's going to work with the budgets we have for that one. Um, and then at 41st, like Alex mentioned, um, we've got to look at the groundwater there. We are going to look at Bangor going under, but we won't be able to take it as low as we have on the other ones because of the groundwater, but but there is an opportunity to take Bangor under and then take 41st uh, partially over that. Um, if you guys have been down at like 126 South, that mm -hmm. interchange at Bangor um, has the same concept. It'll look different than this one will, but, but we had a sewer line there where we couldn't go all the way under. And so we kind of went 
partially and then took it over. But so we're working with Dan and Kobe to, to look at that at 41st and, and we'll look at that and we'll make sure we include that in our budgets, whatever we decide um, to do there at, at 41st. So not in the numbers you saw your spot on there, uh, but as we move forward, we'll make sure that gets included in there at 41st and then 47th, the budget is has it to go under right now. And unless something changes, that's the direction we're headed. Thank you. Okay, Brian, do you mind giving us your last name and who you're with? Yeah, Brian Atkinson with Horrocks Engineers, and I'm a consultant for UDOT on the okay. project. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, not seeing anything else. So thank you for explaining it so well. Yep, no, thank you. I appreciate your guys' time. Um, probably be back in late January, early February to announce all of our public meetings we have coming up. So appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, we'll now turn the time over to Mr. Johnson for our sidewalk priority discussion. I think he's got the next three, so he'll just be up there for a while. Mayor, can I make a quick introduction? Sure. Uh, I just wanted to um, let you guys know that it seems like we've got a lot of these. It does seem to be public works night. It seems like we've got a lot of these items up here, but Dan and I have worked really closely to make sure we get these tight. So don't get too scared. I think we're going to be okay on the number of uh, items we have here. Mostly they're informational. We are looking for a decision on the street sign replacement one and of course possible direction from the council on the speed study criteria. And then of course also we'll try to leave time left for Lincoln, who's not on the public agenda but anyway with that mayor yeah i'll give it back to dan hey thank you great thank you and it is good to be here on public works night and uh I'm grateful to our friends from udot for their presentation and uh, for their cooperation as they work through this very complicated process so we're going to start tonight with street signs uh, we have we've been uh, looking at, at street signs and some of the issues we've had had with them in the past and we'd like to um just just run through that real quick so this is just a, a screenshot of, of the overall inventory of the city's street signs, street name signs um, throughout the city. The different colors represent really the different, they correspond with the color of the sign. In 2009, we changed the street, light, the street sign standard to a black background with, a, with white letters. And at the time, there was an interim version of the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices or the MUTCD that, that allowed for black backgrounds. And when the final version of that document of the MUTCD came out, black backgrounds were not included as an allowable color for street name signs. So, you know, it hasn't really been a big problem, but it's technically we're not compliant with the MUTCD by having black signs. So we've been looking at, at, at some different alternatives. But in addition to that, we've had some problems with the logos. The, uh, the, the logos in, have behaved very sporadically and differently. Some of them faded poorly, some have performed okay. Um, and as we've looked into this thing, um, there's a couple of things that have happened. Um, some of the signs are manufactured by cutting the letters out of a black film that goes onto a reflective sheeting. And, and then they put a sticker on there with the, with the city logo on that. And that city, those, generally those stickers have not performed well. And they, they look really bad, some of them very, very quickly um, in a short amount of time. And so, and then other options, other, you know, that's the, the cutout signs and printed signs are literally, they, they print the entire sign. And um, currently the, the sign manufacturers, they have a handful of colors that they will, that are like the standard colors that they will warranty. And uh, the, the, the yellow and that, that orange and the blue that are in our logo just aren't of those standard colors. And so they, will, they won't be, they would not warranty those if they were printed um, for a long period of time. So, um, so we've been, tonight we're proposing a new street sign design that uh, we've got one here you can look at it in person and handle it if you so desire um, that is a white background with black letters and a black logo black is a standard color that the printed signs will be warrant will, will warranty um, for either 12 or 15 years depending on the manufacturer um, and it is it's a, a color that's allowable by the MUTCD and um, and then in addition to that we, we have the blue signs that are that denote the private streets throughout the city. We really don't propose a big change on those. To, we, we like the, the blue background with the white letters, but we would propose to have the, the logo be in white with a blue background as well, um, which we, we haven't made one of those up yet. But 
Surely you can imagine what that would look like. <clears throat> so Dan, would they cover the blue on that? Yeah, blue is, is a standard color that- Just the orange isn't? Um, it's just that shade of orange and you know we could potentially tweak it to find, in fact, I've got this, the standard colors are black, red, blue, green, yellow, brown, purple, and a color called Warboy green. Okay, so I thought, it, a minute ago, I thought you said they wouldn't warranty the yellow and the blue. So I was just confused about- the Well, it's, it's like an orange and, orange and there's like a certain shade of blue that is the standard oh. blue color. Okay. And so if we were to match that same blue, perhaps we could get there like a blue and a yellow, um, but there's no orange that's on the standard um, warrantyable colors. So. Dan, yeah, one more question about yes. the logo right there. Mm -hmm. Is this the real, it's not a sticker anymore, right? That's printed, yeah. And so on this, this sign, the, the logo is printed just the same way that the letters would be printed. And then they place a, a, ref, a, a protective sheeting over top of it um, just to keep it from being scratched or damaged you know, the other way. And so we feel like this would it this will be a durable solution um, without the colors, but there's no colors too. So if you like the colors, they're not there. Was there a question here? No, okay. Um, so that's, and so what we're proposing is, as Mr. Pyle alluded to earlier is um, we've looked at a couple of different options to replace all of the signs. You saw that what the map looked like with our current uh, efforts and budget levels um, from 2009 to present to get, you know, we, we probably didn't turn half of the city into black signs um, throughout that period of time. And so we would be proposing uh, a, a big, a program mod to do a, a big replacement project of every street sign um, in the city. Um, and, and the first option would be to replace every single street sign pole with a decorative black round pole. It's got a little cap on top um, that it, it looks nice, you know, but, and then the second option would be um, uh, what we currently use, basically just replacing the signs, which is a, a pole on a, it's a, it's a galvanized steel pole with holes all the way up and down. And so nothing fancy, but it does the job and it's substantially cheaper as well, so. So galvanized, galvanized ones take quite a while to rust out. Yeah. The black ones, what is the guarantee on them rusting? Well, we've out? never used them. And um, certainly it, it depends on whether or not they, they chip. If it's a powder coating on that, that, uh, that sign. And so if they get chipped, they're more likely and sus suspect, uh, uh, um, suspect or, or susceptible, excuse me, here's the word, susceptible to rust. So not without risk themselves. Okay. So that's really the completion of our, of our sign discussion. And um, if Wayne has any comments, Don, go ahead. Have we started installing any of the whitening yet? Yes, so there was, uh, we, we received a complaint of a neighborhood that had some um, really bad old green signs and we went and, and just replaced them. So it's, in a, it's a neighborhood that's just off of 35th South, north of 35th South at about 6,200. West, 6290 West. The postman that delivers there says, thank you. Oh. You couldn't read the other signs. The, the other signs are, they're bad. We have a lot of really signs that are- so I don't know what they'll look like at night, but I, you know, I can't read my own street sign on yeah. Dino, so. Well, we, we've taken these out outside at night and the, the white, the, this retro reflective sheeting, it's bright and it's designed to reflect the, the light back in the direction that it came. And so um, they're very legible and, and we encourage you to go check them out. I notice a lot of our green ones, if they're worn at all, especially on the one between signal lights. Yeah. You get, well, one car length away from the street before you, oh, this is one I wanted to turn right on. Yep. And I, Absolutely. Fine. Yeah. And these, the current sign manufacturers, they, they, they're warranty again for this 12 to 15 year period. The reflective sheeting as well and so we expect to get good performance reflective performance off of these signs for a long period of time and uh and as a side note i didn't include any pictures because we haven't put anything up but this these proposals these cost proposals also include changing the signs on every traffic signal in the city as well uh kelvin and whetstone and wayne won't have comments <clears throat> um councilman whetstone you have a question uh, just a quick comment. Um, the the sign I've received a 
positive feedback on the on the white with the black lettering signs um, from a couple of different residents. So um, I think they're so far have, have uh, you know received positive feedback on the on the poll. I guess I'd be indifferent. I I think I'd be fine with remaining with the galvanized, but certainly the signs have received some good feedback, and that's my only comment. It's good to hear. Thank you. Mr. Pyle. Yes, thanks, uh, Mayor. So really from the staff standpoint, what we're looking for is three particular pieces of information here. First, confirmation of whether the sign design itself is okay and if, if the council are happy with that. Second, whether you would prefer for us to move forward with this all in the program mod sort of a, a uh, direction like Dan talked about and do it all across these two years and what we do is hire this contractor print them all up and have them help us uh, from a staff standpoint a street crew standpoint get it done and then third yeah do you want the galvanized pole or do you want the decorative pole because obviously that is a big difference in so those are the three things we're looking for on the street stride, street sign discussion okay thank you um, do we need to make that decision tonight or do we think about it and do it first week of January? Yeah, yeah no, uh, no okay. need tonight. You can do it. Uh, okay. We don't urgent, ma'am. Thanks. Okay. I think it'd be wise for everybody to go out and I've written down the address and see if we like those. And yeah, that'd be great. By day and by night to make sure. <laughs> Excellent. Anybody else have questions, comments? Just in differentiating between the poll types. So, there's obviously a difference in cost with the installation. And once they're up, you know, we've got great student drivers who take these out, you know, every once in a while. And, and so replacing them, are there any consideration, considerable differences between the two? Not really. They're, they're, they're more money, a little bit more money. They've got an anchor that um, that's, I mean, the anchor is a substantial piece of the cost. The, the, the powder coated pole is gonna be a little bit more, but we can reuse the anchor generally if they've been hit. So uh, long-term, we don't anticipate a, a real big difference in cost. It's just the fact that we can reuse most of these galvanized poles. We have a lot of old round poles that we would replace and we included that in the estimate as well, but um, for, the, for the galvanized tail spar poles to keep those if we, were to, if we were to go there. Thank you. How many of those poles do you think you replace a year from people running over them? Oh, I don't know. And Eric's not here and I'm, I'm, I don't know. Can get oh, your number I, if you really want to know. I think in this year, I think I've sent in two requests for new poles that were yeah. flattened just in my neighborhood. Yep. In we, a three minute walk of my house. A lot of uh, stop signs, street name signs, they're particularly problematic because they're on the corners and they get hit a lot. Yeah. Um, street lights, they, we're out, we, we get a lot of vehicle takedowns of our stuff. And if we're not replacing the pole, it'll take a lot less time to get them done. Uh, I would have attaching anticipate. them to those. Yep. Yeah. So realistically, yes, we, we anticipate we, it, for the purposes of, of this discussion, we assume that it would be a, approximately a two year installation um, either way with or without the poles, really because of a sign production capacity. Now, if there was a desire to go faster, we could maybe break the project up into multiple contractors and maybe we should to manage risk of perhaps sign performance, whatever. I don't know, but, but there's lots of, but uh, that's an option we could, um, I, th I think the, I don't know. I don't think we'd be limited by the installation. I think it's actually by the production capacity of the, the local sign shops. Okay. But I'm just thinking. But it, they, a, a single installation absolutely is a lot. You're there for 15 minutes versus an hour probably. And do you put it in fresh concrete, this anchor? Uh, there, there's a couple of, so the anchor actually is driven into the ground. And so if there is existing concrete, we would drill into the concrete if it's suitable for that sign for, for that type of a sign anchor. Um, the other um, is just driven into the ground. It's a, they call it a V-lock anchor. And so the, it's, it's just got a, a, an opening in the middle for the sign pole to go into and then a little wedge to hold it into place. And so you drive that the anchor into the ground and then the uh, pole just goes is just placed in, in and out with it. It's a quick replacement once the the, uh, the base is installed. Okay, uh, Councilman Harmon. Okay, Councilman Harmon has a comment. Just, uh, um, in my 
other business. I bought signs from Utah Correctional Industries. I just wondered if that was one of your contractors that you're working with to get signs made. It never has been. We've never purchased from them before. Something we could explore, but I've we've not. I would I would I don't know their their process, and we would really want to stick with somebody that has a, a manufacturing process that they would warranty. And if they do, that's certainly an option we could explore. I know they do signs for you, Dot. That's why I bring it up. I've heard of you, Dot, before. Okay. So we don't have a manpower to do that because I mean, production is not in. Good. No, no, we don't produce signs ourselves. We we always purchase signs. We don't have a sign shop. Some departments do, but we do not. So did we send out an RFP and give like the prison in different places opportunity to bid on this? No, well, we certainly could. I've never explored the prison's production capacity and their their ability to, to work on something like this. We, we certainly could have that conversation. Yeah, cost-wise, I have no idea what they are compared to yep. others. Okay. Okay, I think that's all. Okay, great. And then your next one is the sidewalk priority discussion. Yes, so um, we did... In the, this this last fall, we completed a an evaluation of, of every single street in the city that does not have sidewalk. And so it, the first part of that was to identify segments of, of missing sidewalk on roads throughout the city. Then the second part of that, we, we identified certain criteria that, that every project, every potential project was given a score based on each of those criteria. So this is a screenshot of the segments throughout the city that don't have sidewalk. And um, there's a lot of them, 237 projects are evaluated. Some projects had multiple segments, but, um, but we, we combined certain segments into realistic constructible projects. So through the magic of modern spreadsheets, we added them all up and um, consolidated them. They're up on the city's website and the, the public works department's website. And uh, um, so we have available for the public to view a, a PDF version of the of, of a spreadsheet that that summarizes the data and the detailed data of each individual project, and then that data is summarized on a map that is uh, that's that there on the left. And so the green projects were projects that scored higher, and the red scored lower. And so um, there's a lot of data there, and um, I'd like to just highlight though that the top 25 uh, scoring projects, this, that's, this is just a list of them. And um, out of eight, so out of those 25 projects, we have funded eight of those through our, our efforts. Most of them are federally funded or whatever, but, um, but I just think that uh, of, of the stuff that we're working on, it actually landed pretty high on the list. And so Really, that's unless you had additional questions, we could, you know, I could answer anything in specific that you might have, but that's just a high level summary of the project sidewalk project prioritization study that we did. Okay, Mr. Harmon. Councilman Harmon. Just my gut uh, take right now is I'd rather spend less money on galvanized signposts and put that towards more sidewalk. So that's combining those two thoughts. Yeah, sounds great. Yeah, I already with him about that. Oh, I didn't see the uh, the uh, Crystal Avenue. Oh yeah, I saw Crystal Avenue. Yep, yeah. Crystal Avenue actually was, it's, well, the bottom, no, it's 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 actually quite high. It scored uh, in this, it, it was 25 out of 237. So it scored high. And the way that this, that the criteria really was laid out is, a lot of value and points were given to, to roads with high volumes. And, um, and so this rose quite high on the list due to the fact that there's, it's, a high, it's a high important school route and, and uh, things like that. And so um, it, I think it actually scored quite well. Uh, it, uh, I see you, uh, you guys uh, planting trees alongside the sidewalk mm -hmm. around here on you know, 2700. West right here. Did we study uh, this, the roof, the shallow and deep roof? Uh, that we, did we have a chance to study that? Because in the future, like 20 years from now, the shallow roof gonna eat in the 
sidewalk. Yeah, we fight sidewalks all over all over the place. Yeah. And so what a the, the oh go ahead. Uh, What's that? So tell me about it. Did you study about it? We did. Yeah, we worked with our parks shallow. department on the selection of those tree varieties to get trees that would not have shallow root systems that would um, damage the sidewalk. And so, yes, we absolutely took that into account, and uh, we we selected trees that should perform well in that type of an environment. It's also a harsh environment with salts and things like that. And so, the the trees that we've selected. Um, they're robust and they're we're hope we we anticipate great performance off of those trees. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, we'll move on to the street street light plan. Okay, so street lights. I've been up here a handful of times talking about street lights, and this is just a reminder where we've been. We the council instituted a new street light fee that took effect January of 2020. We're in the first current, we're in the first full fiscal year of that of having that street light fee. And and as as this was planned, this is a slide from the original presentation, and this was our original plan to increase the operations and maintenance budget and to roughly have about eight hundred thousand dollars to go to internal operations and maintenance, and then half a million dollars annually to go to long term maintenance needs and repairs and capital projects and. Um, and really my whole purpose in, in placing this is that's kind of where we are. That's our plan and that's that has not changed. And so uh, to give you an update, you've all seen, I've been here before talking about bucket trucks and we, we came a long time ago and, and got authorization to purchase a bucket truck. And we just barely got authorization to purchase a chassis for that bucket, bucket truck because we couldn't even order a chassis for the bucket truck. So capital equipment arrival has been slow, but we're still okay because we have we have equipment and 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 things that we've been using. But um, another setback that we had, we had a, an open electrician position since February, and we finally filled that. So we're we're excited about that. It's a, we've, he's been here for less than a month, and uh, but we've got a, a new electrician, and um, and so we have an old bucket truck that this new electrician will work in. But it's it's old, and we anticipate we're excited to replace it when when the new one, the new one finally gets here. And then last week we studied a, an infill project and um, one of our priorities, well, yeah, we studied an infill project and you, you have an opportunity to vote on that tonight to install 34 new lights in various locations throughout the city that don't currently have street lights. And then another thing we're working on is, uh, is we've, we've contacted, one of the constraints that we have is just in-house labor. We don't have enough in-house capacity to, to fix everything that needs to be fixed. And so we have worked with our attorney's office and, and we're, uh, have, we've drafted a, we have an agreement that is kind of an on-call services agreement where we're getting electrical contractors and getting their insurance information and getting them contracted initially um, before we actually give work out so that we can, we can select two or three of them, give them a, get a bid from them and, and then have a more rapid response on getting a lot of this stuff taken care of because we will have shaking hands with them already on the contracting side. And so we've worked with, we've got Skyline Electric and Cash Valley that we're working with and we anticipate Hunt. And we've got, we've got a lot of local contractors in the city that, we're, that we hope to, to have help us to uh, accomplish our goals. So this is where we are going and what we're prioritizing. So for the next three to five years, at least we have, um, we have a lot of light outages, um, areas that have either wire theft or, or bad undergrounds, um, and then just our general service request. And so we're prioritizing existing lights to get them turned back on. And then we were also prioritizing the lighting of, of streets that are unlit. And if we, we have a handful of streets in the city that are unlit. And then in the future, we can tackle a retrofit of the system and replacing old lights as they, uh, as they age. But we're, right now, we're, our main priority is uh, bringing light where it was used to be and lighting up places that never have been. And so this is a screenshot of our current work orders that are open. Um, some of these represent a, a relatively easy fix and some of them represent a, a much more complicated fix. Um, that's just for you to glance at real quick. This is a view of lights that don't have, or streets that don't have lights. Uh, the green ones will be taken care of by this 2022 lighting uh, infill project. 
And then the orange ones will be future lighting projects. And then once we've restored light to the places that aren't lit anymore, we will focus on, on retrofits and replacements. And I just wanted to highlight, so that T and C, that's the town and country fiberglass poles. That's probably our biggest liability in the system where there's lots and lots of buried wire with no conduit and it's hard to repair. And so that's likely where we would start um, after, as we shift it into future endeavors. So that concludes my streetlight presentation. If there's any questions, I will gladly answer them. Okay, to the council. So I'm still getting calls about the wire theft over by H&E. Yeah, on 2400 South and 4800 West. Mm -hmm. Yep. So That's, those businesses are concerned about yeah, I've I've spoken with them and, and that's one of those areas that we are giving to one of those that we're gonna contract with our local contractors to get those those lights turned back on. And as we're dealing with those areas where we've had wire theft, we're making modifications to the street light junction boxes themselves to make theft a little bit more difficult. So, okay. so will theirs be complete this year? Uh it's you know, it's it's soon. I know that that it's. I don't have a, a completion date. You say this year. Twenty three. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. In twenty three, yes, it will. I just want to give them kind of a twenty twenty two. Yeah. I doubt it. Yeah. Okay. Have you told them twenty three? I've told them it, it's coming soon. I've given them a date. <laughs> it's kind of what I've done too. So okay, yeah. next time they call me, we'll say twenty three will work. Yep. Okay. We're well aware of that one. Okay. Okay. All right. Any questions on streetlights? Okay. Okay. Anything else? Um, so this is a follow-up discussion on traffic calming in neighborhoods and speed studies. And there's been a lot of discussion in the council and I, I look forward to having this conversation. So this is a reminder of our current policy. Um, we've had this set since roughly, well, since the early 2000s. And um, when, when the residents uh, petition the city, um, and there's enough of them, we will do a traffic study. We'll measure the speed and the volume of, of the vehicles in a neighborhood. And, um, and then we give them each study a score. And um, the, so the, the criteria for that, is, as we've discussed before, is 10 points for every one mile per hour over the speed limit, uh, half a point for every 100 vehicles on the road, and then points for bike routes, no sidewalks, elementary schools, and other pedestrian generators. And we add them all up. And uh, if, if the score is less than 75, we take no action. If it's between 75 and 99, then it's driver feedback signs, the radar signs, or something else that's not a constructed speed bump. And then if it's over 100 points, we'll install a constructed physical thing, generally a speed hump. So I'm just going to give you some examples of speed studies that we've seen lately. And some of these have been highlighted in council meeting. And um, this first one is 2890 South this is a short little road with not with no with level terrain. It's not a road that we would have expected speeding on, but um, we studied it. And the 85th percentile speed was 25 miles per hour. So they got zero points for speed. It got three points for volume. It's a relatively low volume road. And it got five points for having an elementary school in the vicinity. So a total of eight points. So this one didn't fare well in the traffic calming race. The next one is Stanton Drive. We studied that and got a 85th percentile speed of 29 miles per hour. It got three points for volume. And, um, and then we gave it five points for an elementary school. And it could be argued that you could give it two elementary schools. There are six elementary schools that kids go to from that. All right. Well, we got that. They all have to take Staten because the sidewalk is not complete on 48th. Okay. And there is a bus stop right where the speed sign was for the junior high that went under in the earthquake. Yeah. So my main concern is why aren't they talking to the resident who knows all of this? Um, they certainly could and should, and, and I don't know, if, um, I mean, if we haven't, we should. And so, uh, really from a raw data standpoint, this one, I mean, it didn't get there. I mean, if you added six schools, then okay, I guess it would, but. And a bus stop. And I did, had no clue about the bus stop until I was contacted. Is it a UTA said, bus stop or is it a school bus stop? School bus stop. Okay. And then so, that street is used to go to the UTA 
on 35th for the kids yep. to go to high school. So if, if, depending on how it's evaluated, it, it may be, um, it may qualify for more, but. So how do they reapply? Um, the same process and we can have that conversation. I mean, it's really, it's the same process, but, um, or just make a phone call to, to Eric and he'll gladly take that phone call. And I mean, we wouldn't require a new traffic study, but, but certainly a discussion about the six schools, if there are six schools that we could realistically justify um, would be fed into this, into this neighborhood. And so, but under our current policy and, and, yeah. and thresholds, this would not qualify for any kind of traffic calming. Uh, 2855 West, we studied this and, and it had a, a, an 85th percentile speed of 32 miles per hour. So it got 70 points for speed, uh, six points for volume. And, and then there's an elementary school in the area. And, uh, and so it totaled 81 points and it qualified for um, driver feedback signs and those have been installed. And I, I think they're, you know, they're doing okay. And then the last study example will be Ochre Mesa Drive. And the 85th percentile speed on Ochre Mesa is uh, 38 miles per hour, um, which that is a speeding problem. Granted, it's it's a wider road and it's it's got terrain. And so it's it's honestly a road that I would expect to have higher speeds. But it got 130 points just in speed alone three points in volume, five points for being next to a park, even though it's a future park, but 138 points and it qualifies for speed humps and they'll be installed this next year. So those are just, I thought it was valuable to, to just look at those four studies that we've done. And then we've been doing these studies since 2005. And this is a, an, an aggregation of that data since 2005. So there's 336 speed studies and the 85th percentile speed generally is gonna fall between that 25 and 30 mile per hour speed range. That's what we normally see. And sometimes we'll get something that's that, that's outside of that, but yeah. that, that big, yes, sir. So um, all the cities, they uh, use the same calculation and see the same number as 75 that you study with? Uh, some do, and I'll talk about that in just a second. Yeah, some, there's really- is Lower than 75? Uh, well, the, 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 the index that we use is something that we came up with that actually mirrors something that the county did back in, in 2005, and the county's still doing it, but there's every other city has their own policy. There's no standard um, procedure or, or, or set data or policy for installing these. It really becomes a local decision and will oftentimes just fluctuate with whoever's um, you know, with, with time and people and how they change. So, but I'll cover that in just a second when, when we get there. This is just a different, just looking at that same collection of data, this is um, all of those same studies broken out into the different, um, the 75, you know, greater than 100 between 75 and 99 and less than 75. And so 3% of the studies that we, that we do, that we've done over these, over that great period of time qualify for speed humps and 13% qualified for some kind of a radar sign of some sort, and 84% did not qualify for any kind of traffic calming. And so given our current criteria, this is really what it produces. This is a, a screenshot on the left of, of speed humps, locations throughout the city, and locations of radar signs throughout the city. And uh, that's really what our current, um, current uh, policy and thresholds is producing. So Tom, you mentioned, asked what other cities are doing. We, we looked into that and Salt Lake County is nearly identical to us. Um, they actually have a threshold of 80 points. It's the same, they use the same scoring system other than they give one point per 100 vehicles. We give a half a point. Again, the, the points you get from vehicles are relatively low and, but it would, that's potentially just eaten up by the fact that they have a higher threshold of 80 points. So that's what Salt Lake County currently does. West Jordan historically has had a high use of speed humps throughout their city, but that's getting dialed back just with changing um, dynamics of their either staff or, or council and mayor. Um, that's the direction they're moving. South Jordan has used them in the past, but they prohibit them by policy. They won't install speed humps. Riverton City has actually prohibited them by ordinance. They're illegal to install. 
Um, Sandy City uses many other things, but generally not speed humps. Draper, they generally re will rely on police enforcement requests. And Salt Lake City had a, a traffic calming program that they ended in 2005, but they're starting up a very robust um, program just recently, just now. And so, um, so there is no standard way of doing things. It, they change over time and um, you'll get complaints from people that want speed humps. And if you install them, you'll get complaints from people that don't want speed humps. And then the last slide is just another way to, to visualize the, the summary of the, the data we've, the, we've collected. Um, the, the top line that is the speed threshold, the speed hump threshold. Um, that, and then below that is that below 75 um, line from for other traffic calling measures. And so I'll take any questions if you have any. Okay, any questions? Anything? Okay. So my one concern is just not talking to the people applying yeah. to get the whole story. Yep. And we can certainly we'll we'll have that conversation because there may be some different context on Stanton Drive with with 48th West not having sidewalk. Maybe it is. I don't. Know, that's something we should definitely. That's a conversation we should have. Yeah, because that's where everybody's supposed to walk on because yep. there isn't sidewalk. But just I mean I had no idea that the school bus picked up kids at a certain location even. I drive that street all the time. So I just think talking to the person petitioning would be a big help. Sure. Okay. Remind me, what's the duration of the studies? We study them for a week. <clears throat> yeah. And so when you did the one on Stanton, they had just taken out the dip where if there was already a dip, why did we remove a dip to create a problem? But that's a whole nother story. It was a drainage solution that created a traffic problem. What? That was a drainage solution that created a traffic problem. We took out a dip after we did some drainage work. Yeah, I know. That eliminated, eliminated a need for the dip to move water across the road. Oh, move across the street. Okay. Yeah. I'm like, why would that? That's what the dip was for. It was for moving water. Yeah. Because you put a really nice big pipe down there. So it moves water. It does. Um, and so then it was done so closely. Everybody slows down for that dip, including myself to this day. And it's been gone. Six or eight months. Yeah. So they may need a new traffic study next year anyway. Now that the dip's gone and everybody's like, yep. oh yeah, now my automatic muscle memory is gone and they go a lot faster. Sure. And and in the springtime would be a good time to re maybe relook at that. Yeah. Okay. So just tell her to reach out to Public Works again. Yeah. Okay. Anything what's, else? Oh, yep. What's the reason that so many other cities? in the area have prohibited either by policy or ordinance. I think there's just, it's differing opinions. It's, it's neighbors, like it's the, some people love them, some people hate them. And whoever's the loudest, I truly believe that's the main reason um, for certain cities prohibiting them. It's just, it could be their, their city leadership that has personal preferences against them, or it could be the, the constituency that they hear from. That's very interesting. I do wonder if we load the uh, test hole from 75 to 70, how much can it impact in our city? Yeah, that, you study it, that? It, would, it would, yeah, you'd have, I don't have, you know, like, not yeah, see that across, but... you'd be, you'd be somewhere in here and you'd, you'd throw in another 10 or 15, 20 roads um, into some kind of uh, different scenario. Nobody else? Okay. okay, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, we'll now turn the time over to Lincoln for the legislative update. Because it's coming soon. 35 days away. It's already started. But who's counting? <laughs> Most of us are counting on Christmas. Right, exactly. My count, my clock's a little different. Um, Thanks, Mayor. Thanks, uh, members of the council for the time today to talk a little bit about the legislative session. As I mentioned, we're 35 days out from the legislative session, and then we jump into the 45-day circus that is the Utah State Legislature. Uh, that is 45 calendar days, so it ends up being roughly 33, quote-unquote, working days uh, at the Capitol. And in that time, historically speaking, 
They contemplate and pass about 750 pieces of legislation, and this year we'll be balancing a $28 billion budget. So in and of itself, just balancing the budget in, uh, in 45 days would be a monumental task, but then to debate that much policy within that time is pretty significant as well. Um, today was a fairly significant day for the state of Utah in that Governor Cox got to release the largest budget in state history with a roughly $3 billion surplus uh, in Utah. What's interesting about the surplus numbers that we're seeing is most of that surplus they're going to be treating as one-time dollars, even though much of that is coming in in the way of income tax. The reason they're doing that is I think all of us are kind of looking at the potential headwinds in the economy and not wanting to fund ongoing programs with dollars that may be a little bit susceptible to a downturn in the economy. So with even a $3 billion surplus, uh, much of that surplus dollars is going to be going to one-time efforts. As I mentioned, $28 billion budget. Of that, the governor had suggested a $1.3 billion tax cut uh, that would span over three years. Part of that would come in a weighted property tax cut or credit. So that wouldn't be anything that would affect local governments, but in essence, you could apply for an income tax credit based on what you paid in property tax and the state would rebate back a portion of your property tax dollars that were otherwise paid. In addition to that, there would be a kind of straight up income tax credit that would again be weighted based on income of the individual who's applying for those credits as well. There are a couple of big keynote items within his budget that I think are going to be significant to local government. One is uh, a half a billion dollars, just over $516 million that he's allocated towards water projects, both in water conservation, water preservation, and water development projects throughout the state that obviously will impact both our, our special service districts, but also us as water providers within our communities as well. Much of that's going to be coming in grant dollars. So um, historically speaking, the legislature has done a lot of the appropriation work. Over the last few years, they've moved to a process by which they're giving the money in kind of block grant funding towards agencies and then allowing the agencies to develop criteria wherein cities or local governments can apply for those resources through the agency. So a big agency that we'll be wanting to pay attention to this year once this legislative session passes is going to be the Department of Natural Resources, who is going to have roughly a half a billion dollar fund uh, for these types of water projects. Additionally, there were some resources that he put in his budget, about $55 million towards affordable housing efforts within our communities. Some of that's to help first-time home buyers. Some of it's to sustain or preserve existing affordable housing stock within our communities, and then a potential for some incentives in communities as well. So a host of things within that budget. As you can imagine, it's about a 350-page budget, lots of stuff to cover. I will have a detailed outline that I'll be submitting to staff and to the council as well, so I can at least give you the top line of what's going on in that budget. In terms of the legislative process within 45 days, um, a lot of policy work is going to be done. Uh, the legislature is a political body. It's Republicans and Democrats. This year, the House is 60 Republicans, 15 Democrats after the most recent uh, election. So super majority Republican. The Senate is the same, 23 Republicans, six Democrats. And fortunately or unfortunately, depending on what side of the aisle you sit, uh, those who have the majority are the ones that control the budget. Um, for West Valley City, what that means is we don't have a lot of Republicans that represent West Valley City. In fact, we have two in the House of Representatives, uh, Quinn Cotter, who recently was elected as a newly elected official, and then obviously uh, Representative Rohner um, is in the legislature as well and could be helpful for us in that respect. But in terms of the budgeting process, where we spend a lot of our time on our proactive agenda, uh, the Republican leadership is an important place in which we spend a lot of time. As it relates to our policy work, we do a lot of work kind of across the board from legislators throughout the state, not only those working in West Valley City, but obviously have to find advocates in leadership positions, which come from all corners of the state. So we spend an inordinate amount of time not only working with our legislative delegation from West Valley City, but working with delegations from throughout the state to understand the priorities and why it will be impactful for projects to be done in West Valley City, even though they may not necessarily represent West Valley City specifically. Um, in terms of our legislative agenda this year, hopefully you've been receiving the updates that we've been sending to the council and following up on those updates coming into the 2023 session. We're really at the beginning stages. I know it sounds late with only 35 days, but with the budget just being released today, that really becomes the framework by which we set a lot of the policy in the direction uh, in which we intend to go as the city. And as city staff, we're following the resolution that you've passed, 22-14, that kind of gives us direction as to how we want to approach those issues. 
some of the key policy areas that we're focusing on this year is obviously homeless resource centers uh, has been a big topic throughout Salt Lake County for quite some time. There is going to be some efforts on changing the process by which we assign uh, new temporary shelters within the Salt Lake Valley area, as well as how we fund those shelters. So we're very keenly watching those in kind of a reactive or defensive posture as West Valley City. Another one in which it's a defensive posture is on justice courts. Uh, so there has been an effort for the last several years to look at changing the way in which we administer the court system in the state of Utah. Justice courts are one of those issues as well. We obviously want to kind of jealously guard the investments that we've made in West Valley City's justice court. So we'll be working very closely on that. And then a big portion of our effort is on funding through some of these grant programs that I mentioned at the outset. So whether that's recreational or arts grants for the Maverick Center or for the theater, um, or if it's on infrastructure funding, whether that be water infrastructure or transportation infrastructure. I thought it was great. I was going at the end of Dan since I spent a lot of time with he and his staff talking about the infrastructure investments we intend to make here in the city. I uh, also spent a lot of time with Steve Pastrick and his team as we talk about many of the land use policy issues, as well as the affordable housing issues that we're dealing with within the city. And then obviously Mark Nord and his team as we're discussing economic development. Really, our goal is to take direction from you as the council and have been using the resolution that you passed as the guiding document for that effort. As things begin to morph, morph as they inevitably do in the legislative process, yeah. we're hoping that our daily updates, which are status report updates, are helpful for you in tracking bills that you have a keen interest in. And then obviously we provide an end of week report for the council as well. So you can see the things that not only we've been working on, but we're tracking so that if you have any questions or concern, you can continue to kind of give us guardrails in terms of the direction we're taking the legislative policy advocacy work that we're doing here in the state. I'll quickly end on the federal note. Um, as I'm sure many of you have been watching, there's been a lot of federal effort uh, over the last several months and even year, year and a half with the Infrastructure Reduction Act and other investment efforts that have been made by the Democratic Congress. What was interesting is with Republicans taking leadership of the House, uh, most recently at the congressional level, they have agreed to keep earmarks, which is a good thing for West Valley City in that through the Democratic administrations, we were successful in getting several of the earmarks for some transportation investment into those budget items. Republicans have agreed to keep that process. So our federal efforts moving forward very well on some of the most recent news that you've heard in terms of these investment opportunities, the federal government is very slow. As you heard UDOT uh, saying earlier, sometimes it takes years to write the rules around many of these programs that they're administering. The same is true on many of these efforts as well. So many of the things that we are talking about or you're hearing in the news, the rules are not even written yet, likely won't be written until the summer of next year, which will really be the guidepost that we use in applying for any of those funds, either, the, either federally or at the local level on the pass through dollars that come in. We've been actively coordinating with UDOT and other relevant agencies on what those efforts are going to look like and how we can insert ourselves into those efforts. But at this point, it's a little bit of a no one knows what the rules are, so there's not a lot of effort that we can really put into specific allocation of those resources and kind of advocating on behalf of the city. Last thing I'll end, um, really try to keep you up to speed. We spend an inordinate amount of time coordinating with other policy groups that you're familiar with including Chambers of Commerce, Wasatch Front Regional Council, the Utah League of Cities and Towns, a host of groups that kind of work on advocacy work that touches local government in West Valley City in particular. So we try to infuse those into our updates as well. Certainly, if you have any questions about anything, don't hesitate to reach out to us as the team to help you kind of stay abreast of the issues that are taking place over the next 45 days. With that, Mayor, don't have much more to add and happy to take any questions. Okay, any questions? <laughs> okay, That's good job. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Council calendar, any questions or concerns? Okay, we'll move on to potential future agenda items. Anybody? I have two. I would like a communication item on um, talking about maybe rejoining Utah, I mean, yeah, Utah League of Cities and Towns. And then an update on the moderate income housing. I guess a lot of cities, including us, fell that filing and just trying to figure out why, if we got an answer. Okay. Anybody else? Mayor. Yes. Just quick on the, the moderate income housing plan. We did, as you know, yes, we did uh, fail that and we did check back in with the state as to what the requirements are. My understanding as of a couple of weeks ago, we're well on 
on the way, if not already reapproved for uh, passage of that. But yeah, we'll be glad to bring that before the council for communication. Okay. All right, thank you. Mayor, can you elaborate why you want to uh, rejoin with the Utah League? Utah League, I've just had a couple of council members ask about it. And so just wanted to revisit it since they weren't on the council when we uh, made that change. And especially with the homeless, the temporary homeless shelters, um, they have invited me to come to those meetings with the league because we are a big part of it. And they felt like we shouldn't be left out of the talk, but they are doing us a kind gesture because we didn't pay any dues or anything to be into the talk. So it's just that whole. No, they're being kind and in including us, but they don't need to. So, okay, council reports. Just quickly, uh, as I said during the finance report, I was at the the uh, annual Christmas dinner for uh, South Salt Lake County Mosquito Abatement District. <laughs> That's a long card. It is. <laughs> and uh, coming home, it was right after they had received that they're out on uh, Airport Way, just across from Airport Number Two entrance. And they had received about six inches of snow during that dinner. And uh, coming home, I took my usual off road route down 40th West through Kearns and Taylorsville. And as soon as I crossed 47th South, roads were clear. They had been out clearing, and you know it was it, it wasn't snow packed or anything on the rest of 40th, but it was slushy and hadn't been cleared as well as ours had. So, and that was eight o'clock or so last night. So, congratulations to your crews. Today we had the Healthy West Valley committee meeting, and they discussed quite a few things. Uh, there's a new My Hometown area in West Granger, and they're going to plan a health fair probably in the February, late January or February time frame. Okay. And uh, they just wanted us to be aware of it on Healthy West Valley and see if we could help them out, and we told them we could, and so they're going to be off and running. Uh, we're still working on the proposal for help in all policies. And uh, they said they haven't talked to any of the staff leadership yet, so you can't listen to Nicole. <laughs> but uh, they've got a proposal that's almost ready for city staff to look at and go through and see if we, they can make any changes. Then they'll bring a... a uh, uh, an agenda item to us. <laughs> Resolution. <laughs> That's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> Hi, Dan. <laughs> uh, resolution uh, for, our, for the council. Okay. But it'll be basically kind of training the staff in writing the policies to include health aspects, you know, to be aware of how it will affect different areas of health okay. and personal things. Uh, they're looking at uh, sponsoring a fall fest, you know, after West Fest, between that and Winter Fest, uh, having another activity in there for the city. And uh, we'll be using some of the funding uh, as we look at it from the Help and All Policies grant that we received to help fund that all fast. Uh, healthy community, we are, a, are recognized as a healthy community in the state. We were one of the pilot communities three years ago and qualified. And we have to requalify again in 2023. So it's basically continuing what we're still doing and adding a few more things should be no problem, but they just wanted to know on the radar. So those are the, the main things we discussed there. The coalition is growing 
At the time we have a meeting, and so I think it's, uh, it's going to be a viable coalition ongoing, too. Great. Thanks for helping start it, Jake. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> hey, thank you for that report. Uh -huh. And no others. Okay. Uh, we'll move on to our three agendas for on January 3rd, RDA. And Mr. Pyle's gonna take all of these unless he needs help from Mr. Lehman. Uh, yes, ma'am, thanks. So all three of the agendas uh, are looking for the election of new officers for the new year. And the RDA agenda does have that one extra item on property line uh, realignments, which I will ask Steve to take that one. But you can go ahead, Steve. Okay, thank you, Mr. Pyle. Uh, this is a resolution that authorizes the redevelopment agency to convey property to the city of West Valley. So this is a parcel plat map. Uh, the area that is in red here are properties that lie just north of City Hall. Uh, the two pieces at the top are owned by West Valley Office Holdings. Uh, the piece just in the middle, uh, this piece is owned by the RDA. And then the uh, two pieces where the banks used to be Zions and US Bank are also owned by the RDA and the other pieces are owned by West Valley City. So you'll see from this illustration, um, Market Street, there is a parcel here uh, that was a result of the vacation of Market Street when we did the Fairborn Station phase one subdivision. So that's in West Valley City ownership. Just to the east of that, you also have property in West Valley City ownership, and then you have the redevelopment agency of West Valley City. So uh, the purpose of this, we are going to be doing a subdivision plat, which we will bring to the city council in a couple of weeks time. Uh, there's been a lot of moving parts, as you know, in this area. So we want, we've waited until some of these pieces have solidified to bring a subdivision plat to the city council. So if I could get Eric to go to the next slide, it'll kind of help you see what, what we're proposing. So as you can see, this property uh, is owned by the RDA. Uh, obviously you see the line that cuts through the public safety building. Uh, so the purpose of this application is to convey this property from the RDA to West Valley City, just simplifying uh, what it is that we're proposing to do with the subdivision, which is essentially to consolidate old property lines, establish new lots for the public safety building and future commercial uses in this area. And that is our report. Hey, thank you. Any questions for Mr. Lehman? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Turn it back over to Mr. Pyle. Nothing else from me, ma'am, good. The Housing Authority and the BA only have election of new officers, so no report there. Okay, Correct. thank you. All right, do we have a need for a closed session? No. no. Okay. And we just have one more motion. Motion to adjourn. Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, thank you so much. We stand adjourned. We'll see you at 6.30.